Bible, my glasses, a microphone, and my notes. So uh, that'll be good. So when I was in Illinois, I attended a little bit of a, a, a very small church, and it was a wood frame structure. And one one summer, they decided that they were going to repaint that, and there wasn't. Uh, a large congregation and, it, and they didn't have a lot of resources and so they, they paint, got the first side painted and they looked and they went, wow, it's going to take a lot of paint and this is going to be expensive. So they started on the second side and they thinned the paint out a little bit more and they got through it but they thought, wow, this is still going to take a fair amount of money. So they got to the next side, the third side, and they thinned it some more. And then by this time, the paint's getting pretty runny. They decided on the fourth side that they, they couldn't afford to buy any more paint, but they started out and they heard this loud, booming voice that said, repaint and thin no more. So, <laughs> so there, there's your letter. All right. keep telling my daughters there is no such thing as a bad dad. Okay, we are going to Job. We are going to Job 1. And I think you want to go along with this deal. So, let's go to Job. We are going to read the whole um, the whole chapter. Not the whole book. Just, just one chapter. Job, Psalms, Proverbs. We're going to Job 1. Job is a interesting person. Uh, what a wonderful story! And there are some really, uh, there are some things there that really make us ponder some things. So, Job one, read along with me. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking... Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Saint replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Saint. Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky, burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has survived to escape to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on their camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed.
latched on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. In verse 20, then, at this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the guidance it gives. And, and Father, I would ask that uh, this morning that you would speak and, and let our ears hear, our hearts be touched by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're going to go through this a little bit verse by verse. But we started out by talking about Job. We talked, uh, started by talking about Job and his wealth, right? So in Bob and I's world, we needed two, two acres of the cow, right? And so then in sheep terms, you can run seven sheep or you can run one cow, right? Okay, so if Job has, how many sheep did he have? 7,000 sheep. So if we're doing that right, if we're kind of doing that math, is that 14,000 acres? Something like that. Um, he's got 500 donkeys. Why would you have 500 donkeys? I don't know. 3,000 camels. Now, did they milk? What? I mean, camels were used for load bearing, right? They they moved people with camels. But what else? What other use was there for camels? Did they eat camels? I think that'd be a little tough. But I don't know. How come there were so many camels? And 500 yoke of oxen. So that means a thousand head. I think a yoke would be two. So that's. There's a lot of stuff here, right? A lot of stuff. And then he's also got a family, so he's got a wonderful family. Job has all of this stuff, right? So I'm impressed by the livestock. You know, that takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of servants. I don't think they had autos, if they had 14,000 acres, I don't think they had auto steer on their ox. I don't know, but I'm gonna guess. But then, so we, we recognize that Job is very affluent, I guess is the way to say that. But then we go to verse 5 and we see what Job does. He has this family that, that he obviously thinks a lot of. And the family gets together and they, they feast and drink wine and have a wonderful time together as a family. And what does Job do there in verse 5? It says that he prayed, he gave intercessory prayer for his family, right? It basically is what he says. It says in verse 5 that he offered a burnt sacrifice and prayed, prayed for his family. Hope, hoping that they had not sinned against God. Right? How often did, did, did Job do this? I think the word in the Bible that, that God uses is regularly. He did it regularly. So this might be an interesting thing for us to think about. And then we get into some more interesting things and we look at verse 6. And in verse 6 it says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan was with them. What does God say to Satan? Where have you been? Where have you been? Did God and Satan know one another? Pretty well, huh? Where you been? So if we believe in God, 
who else do we have to believe in then? We have to believe there's a devil, right? If we believe there is a heaven, what do we have to believe there is? Interesting thought, isn't it? God and Satan know one another well. They're both alive. They are both real. And then we're going to verse 8. And this one just, wow. So in verse 8 it says, uh, the, the most important part of it, in my mind at least, is, have you considered, God says this, have you considered my, son, my servant Job? So what are we trying to do as we live our life? You know, we're kind of kind of trying to write a life that reads pretty good on a tombstone, right? Um, he was a good father. She was a good mother. Um, they did great works. Uh, they had a wonderful life. Uh, he was a good farmer. He was loyal to his business. Whatever, whatever that tombstone might read. What was Job's tombstone going to read? Written by God. Have you seen my servant, Job? Wow. That's kind of what I'd like to have on my tombstone, is, is God to write that with his finger. He was a servant. Don't live up to that, but that is, isn't that what we would try to aspire toward or would like to? And then in verse 12, we've talked about that God and Saint knew one another pretty well. In verse 12, then the Lord said to Satan, Satan says, you know, I want to do uh, Job is is the reason Job's so loyal to you is because you've treated Job so well, right? So it's all about reward. And what does what happens there in verse 12? When the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So what are we recognizing there? Does Satan have any authority without God's permission? Does Satan have any authority without God's permission? And I see several of you going. Satan had to ask or be granted permission to work on Job, right? God allowed it. But Satan had to have permission. And so we think about the power of the devil. But how much greater is the power of God? Much greater. All right, so we're going to continue then. So we've talked about Job's wealth. We've talked about Job being a servant of God. We've, we've talked about God being real, the devil being real. So then we get into the next part of that deal, and how do we, how do you and I, define a bad day? boss is mad, my back hurts, mom got mad at me, I threw a temper tantrum and got spanked, um, how do we define a bad day? Stub my toe? How do you think Job defines a bad day? My wealth is, my camels are gone, my donkeys are gone, my sheep are gone, my servants are dead, and what? And my family's dead. So how bad a day is that? I don't think that we can, can fathom something much worse than that. So Job had a bad day. And 
And then we get to the moral of the story, if you will. In verse 20, and I'm going to reread it. At this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. So here's the, here's the three things that stick out in my mind in this chapter. God and Satan are real. We all believe that, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But sometimes I think we, we, we focus on the grace of God and we focus on the power of God. What I sometimes fail to recognize is that the devil is a work because God allows it for a time. For a time. Alright? And then the next thing that sticks out is my servant Job. God knows Job. God knows Daryl Cross. God knows Jen Slaughter. God knows us. And God recognized Job. Have you seen my servant? Wow. Isn't that pretty neat? And then the third thing that sticks out at me is Job's reaction. Did Job get mad? Did Job lose his temper? Did Job curse God? Did Job do anything that I would have done? No. Job shaved his head, tore his clothes, and bowed down and worshiped God and said thank you. Thank you for the grace that you have provided. Thank you for being a sovereign God. Would that have been my reaction? I don't know. I guess that's the reason we read about Job in the Bible. All right, we're gonna we're gonna com uh, complete this little uh, deal with a couple of other scriptures, and I want you to turn with me to John, John nine. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. It, now, this would be Jesus, right? We've, we've gone from Job to Jesus. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Rabbi, who sinned? Think this through now. We see a blind man. They asked, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. So they... Uh, Assume because this guy's blind, somebody sinned. Right? That's the reason he's blind. And what is Jesus' response in verse 3? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Did Job sin? to cause the wrath of the devil. No sin there. You know, according to the account, he was blameless before God. Was he perfect? No, we know he wasn't perfect. But he was blameless before God. Did he sin to cause this? No. So what does verse 3 say there again? We're going to reread that again because I think it's hugely important. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God could be glorified. 
So why did Job go through all this stuff? So a little anecdotal story, a lovely, lovely couple in Marshalltown, and some of you know them, faith beyond belief, absolutely as Job, servants of God. The gentleman gets Alzheimer's. He was a fabulous role model. He was a fabulous person. His mind just goes away. Was that because of sin? No. I don't believe so. It was so that the works of God could be glorified, right? And watching his wife care for him through that whole process and the, the, the absolute love and devotion that she had not only for her, her husband but for her God, glorified God. So was it because of sin that he got Alzheimer's? Was it because of sin we got cancer? Was it because of sin we had a stroke? I don't think so. I think it has more to do with how are we going to react and are we going to be able to glorify God through that process. Alright, one more final one and then it's roast beef and potatoes for Ephesians 6. It's not going to be roast beef and potatoes at our house, is it? Ephesians 6. 10 to 12. Ephesians 6. Todd uh, touched on this a little bit in his uh, communion meditation. Yeah. Ephesians 6. 10 to 12. Finally, be are you there? Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We know that God is real. We know that the devil has power that is granted by God. We know that a great spiritual battle is being raised that we can't even see, that I can't see, that I, that I don't understand. We know that if God recognized Job as his servant by name. And we also know what Job's reaction was to tragedy. God gives us Job's story as an encouragement, probably as a little bit of a kick in the seat of the pants, and as an account of what's really important. Now, Job, as you all know, Job goes through way more. We're not going to talk about everything that Job went through. But on the back end of this deal, how does Job come out? He went, right? He won. God, he stood in God's favor. And it was a wonderful thing. Isn't that what we're trying to do? We've chosen the side that we want to be on. We've seen what it's going to take. It's going to be tough. But we want to be on the winning side. And we want God to recognize us as a servant. Let's pray.